Now you got to listen to me even more. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm going to try and keep it short. Oh, I'm going to look at the clock. All right, I got, I was saying this morning, I have a really hard time. I don't pay attention to the clock very well. So we are going to continue in our sermon series. Um, This is actually the last in our series of who God says you are. Um, And we've kind of looked at different bits and pieces of identity. um, And we are who God says you are. Do we have the other ones that have each sort of slide? We talked in the beginning, we talked about, uh, I'm sorry, um, um, Jackie talked about we are our history and our body right? And, and those kinds of, uh, what has happened to us and how we look. I'm six foot six and 350 pounds. You know, that's a part of my identity. I just can't get away from that. Yeah, I know. He's like, I didn't hear that. You don't want to hear that. It's too big. Um, <laughs> we're, we're laughing. I was laughing with a bunch of therapists because uh, we got together and uh, many of us, it was like, this is the first time I've actually seen you in person. I've never actually met you. I've known you for two years. And holy cow, you're big. Um, yes, yes, I am. Um, <laughs> so uh, you are your body. You are your history. You are a mind. Um, and I shared a little bit about that when I shared some very specific things um, because I, I'll, oftentimes we deal with guilt and shame. It's how we think, you know, and, and uh we're going to talk a little bit about change, but how we think in the midst of our change really um, begins to play a part in that. And uh, you are your relationships. Theo talked about that, that it's in relationship that we really kind of begin to discover who we are. We're kind of like mirrors to one another kind of a thing. And we can see one another, but also that our relationships shape us. Tell me who you hang out with and I can tell you who you are kind of a thing. It's one of the things we teach our teenagers all the time. Who are your friends? Because who you're hanging out with gives me an indication of kind of what's going on and where you're at. We looked at commitments and actions that those relationships then begin to drive. If I'm in relationship, there's certain things they begin to do, like bleach your hair um, or not turn it pink. That was the conversation that Jackie and I were having as we walked in this morning. Somebody asked her, how, guys, how come your hair's never been pink? And it's because her husband says, I don't think I like pink hair. Um, so... <laughs> Out of relationship, there's actions and commitments and things that get done. And same with Christ. As our relationship grows, there's things that we begin to do, not out of duty, not out of, yeah, I have to rules, but that I do because I love and I'm in, in response to that relationship kind of a thing. We talked a little bit last week about boundaries. Relationship boundaries define us. It tells me who I am and who you are, where I start and where you start. Um, it helps us know when to stop and when not to, you know, which is some of the things that are really cool characteristics of God as well. Uh, and again, reading through Old Testament, one of the characteristics of God is he knew when to stop. He knew when to stop creating. He knew when to stop destroying Um, We see that in Genesis 1, he stops creating. And the Noah story, he stops destroying. Um, So it's really an interesting kind of idea, but boundaries in in who who we are in our identity. And today we're going to go into a little bit more of we are an ongoing process of change, and therefore we are our future. And so we're going to look a little bit at this. And uh, again, the outline for this comes out of a book that uh, is a... uh, Klein Snodgrass, who is a professor at North Park Seminary. And again, that's the outline for our sermon series. That's not where uh, we come from. We're going to be in Philippians today. So if you want to go ahead and start flipping to Philippians, we're going to kind of do a scan over kind of a thing. But one of the things that Snodgrass talks about in this is that our identity is not this static set of here it is, line it out. He says our identity is a narrative. It's the story. It's a story of who we are, kind of a thing. And so each of these components play a part in that. And for those of you that are English majors or literature uh, majors, Spencer, my friend, if you're watching online, I apologize. I'm going to slaughter uh, narrative uh, and storytelling today, but I'm going to use a little bit of that to kind of help us look at this. But our identity is. It's the story that we tell. And in a story, there's movement. It's not a static thing. The characters, we see the characters grow. We see the characters change. We see them experience different things, 
right? Their history and how, who they are and what they look like um, affect the arc of the story and some of those kinds of things. So our identity is like a story. It's a narrative. And we're growing and we're moving through it. And there are things that happen and climaxes and res- that change things, but we continue to move. We continue to progress through that. And we're going to look a little bit in... in Philippians, Paul begins, I wish I could preach like Paul. As I was studying this, Paul starts almost every one of his books giving you this really good summarization of what the Christian life is about. Here it is. This is what it's all about. Do, 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 do. Now that you have that summary, here's what I need you to do. He's amazing at it. Paul was a genius. I'm not. But we were look, I was looking at this, and Paul does this again in Philippians. And we're going to start... We are a process of change. And Paul even recognizes this in Philippians 1, starting in verse 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. And he says, um, sorry, i got to switch over. Um, Wrong one. There it is. I'm going to read out of the New Living today, though it's really good to read out of a book. But every time I think of you, Paul writes, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began a good work in you, will continue this work until it is finally finished on the day Christ returns. This is the opening that Paul opens this letter with. So Paul's writing this letter to the Corinthians and he says to them, if you're still breathing, God's not done yet. I'm not sure where that quote comes from. It's one of those kind of things that's growing in the church. We hear all the time, God is good all the time. If you're still breathing, God's still working, right? Right? It's one of those kind of phrases. I don't, I'm not sure where it came from, but it is. And Paul writes in Philippians, he says this. He says, if God is doing something, you're, God, you are in this process of change, and God is going to bring it to completion. And that's the journey that we're on, and our identity is a part of that. Part of what's difficult, though, I think about identity, and again, as we talk about this, identity is this narrative, and in the narrative, we're constantly, the, the narrative is moving forward, which means we're moving, we're changing, we're headed somewhere, and Paul's going to talk about that, and we're going to kind of look at this as we overview Philippians, but that's where we're going. Each of these components play a part of that, but if we get stuck on a single piece of it, we begin to miss out. If I get so wrapped up in this piece of my identity, where's the story going? And if we stop moving, does change, do we not change? Water, when water is moving, what happens to the water? Streams flow, right? The streams flow, it cleans it, right? Moving water is clean water. What happens to Still water, it stays the same, right? If the water stops moving, what happens to it? It still changes, it becomes stagnant, right? And it actually becomes very unhealthy for us. And so life is this stream, it's this moving along, and and we can't stop in this journey. Our identity is one that we're continuing to move forward. We're, We're asked to become more and more like Christ, The ask of the relationship with Jesus Christ is to be transformed, to be changed. And if we stop in that growth, if we stop in that process, we become stagnant. We become, change still happens, but it's not always happy change or good change. And so Paul's writing to the Philippians and he's saying, I pray for you and I have hope. This is a very positive letter because he has hope, because he sees these changes happening. He sees them moving forward in it. They're not wrapped up in one piece of who they are. They're not wrapped up. We see when uh, uh, when I reference that, one of the things I thought of is the struggles that we see in our culture today, the struggles over identity. 
And so much of it in our struggles over identity is because we define ourselves by a single piece. I had an argument with a pastor uh, around the time of the elections. And I'm, again, I'm not going to get political. That's not my point. But in this argument, I kept saying to him, you're making this about one thing. We are, a, we are as Christians, we are about more than one thing. We're about this whole story. And how does the whole story fit into it? But if I had defined my identity by this one piece, I am a tall, large, bald male. There's a whole lot of the story that I miss out on. It's a piece of it. But if I, stamp my, if I make my stand right there and stagnate right there, it can begin to have some problems. So Paul's, again, asking the Philippians, we're, we're making this progress. We're moving forward. I pray for you that you will continue on this journey, this continual change as we head towards and he even gets into what is it that we head towards. And this is where it's great to have, you know, Bible is nice and easy to transport around in an iPad and that kind of stuff. But there's something about being able to look at it in a book form that gives you an ability to overview, right? And see it from a 10,000 foot level and then go into it. Too often, I think, as Western mindsetted readers, we want to dive in and get the details and get the, the nitty gritty, but we haven't looked at the bigger picture yet. And so this book of Philippians is a really interesting one to look at from that standpoint. And again, if you look at chapter one, you see Paul opening this up with this prayer that he hopes that we are on this journey. He talks about what it is to live in Christ. That is the what the call is that we are to live into Christ. And then as we're kind of flipping again, if you're in a book, you can see that he goes from that right into what that is to live in Christ. And chapter two opens with an example of what it is to look like Christ, the mindset of Christ kind of a thing. And then the results of that. He then moves right out of that to say, here's some examples. Let me, let me give you some, some accolades. Timothy, I'm sending to you because he has been able to demonstrate this in his life. And I'm going to send you uh, another Aphrodite. Yes, thank you for working on your Greek. My Greek is not so good. Um, and again, he uses those as an explaining how this looks in the church. And in relationship. And then he ends with recognizing here's a situation that needs this brought into it. There's a conflict between two women who are good, godly women, he says. And this thing of what it looks like to be in Christ is needed in this place. It's a really cool book. We don't have time. I, this, we, someday we come back and just do the whole book as a series which we, Jackie and I like to do as well. We like to do book series where we're going, not just through, not a book of somewhere else, but a book of the Bible. But we need to look at this big picture view of what Paul is talking about, this journey, this transformation, the narrative that we're going on. And it's easier if you sometimes have it in a book form rather than on an iPad. But I am gonna pull out a couple of, of little things as we go along in this. Because our story has this movement, this narrative kind of a thing. Salvation is that process. I recently was reading a book by John Orderberg. One of his new books out is called uh, Eternity is Now in Session. And in it, he talks about we might need to kind of reorient ourselves as to what salvation really is. Because too often in the church, we think that salvation is that moment that I pray this prayer, we call the sinner's prayer, and I'm saved. And he says, that's important. Don't get me wrong. You have to make a decision in order to be in relationship. We talked about relationships before. And then once I'm in relationships, there's multiple relationships that I make. And the way he describes it, he says, what we have to really realize is that salvation is this process of moving through being transformed. He says, oftentimes what we're doing in salvation when we say, you're saved if, and he, he describes two ideas of how we view salvation. One is a closed set, and the other is center set. And what he means by that, he talks about, he says a closed set is this 
you belong to that if you meet these criteria, right? There's this set prescribed things. If you, if it has four sides and there are four equal sides and there's four 90 degree corners, you have a what? A square. There is a set defined criteria as to fitting into that category. And oftentimes we think of salvation in those terms. There's this set things that I got to do. And if I meet all of those criteria, then I'm in. I'm a part of that group. And there are things that we need to do. We talked about that. That in the relationship, there's actions and there's commitments that need to be made. And there's things that I've got to do to move forward. He says, but is that what Christ is talking about when he talks about being saved? And is that what Paul talks about when he's talking about this journey of transformation? What John Orderberg says is salvation is more of a center set. And in a center set definition, you have an ideal. You have here is the thing, here is the example of what we should meet, right? A perfect circle is what? It's 360 degrees, the same radius or same diameter all the way around, right? But I can belong to the circle set. Is the, is the earth a circle? Our science people, is the earth actually a circle? The earth is not actually a circle. It is actually a little bit oblong, right? It's a little out of shape because it's, we think partially because it's spinning, it kind of stretches around the middle kind of a thing. But then when you look at the earth, when you look at a globe, it looks like a circle. You would say that belongs in that category. It belongs to that category because it approximates this perfect circle. And what John Orderberg talks about is salvation is about that. Salvation is Christ is the perfect ideal. And you belong to the set. You belong to that when you are on this process in this journey of approximating the ideal. You are working on and moving towards becoming more like Christ. We hear that all the time in the church. Becoming more like Christ. This journey is about that. And that's what Paul begins to write in this, in Philippians. It's about becoming more and more like Christ. And, and he, he says the advancement of the gospel comes through this, to live, as Christ, to live in Christ, um, I rejoice, for I know that through your prayers. And then he gets to the example of what it is to be like Christ. In chapter 2, and we're going to read that next. In chapter 2, starting at verse 1, he says, here it is. This is the example that you have the mind of Christ is some, oftentimes the, t- the heading of this. And it just simply says, is there any encouragement in belonging to Christ? Again, the belonging is that we're moving towards him. Is there any comfort in his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Well, I think he's starting to hint some things. Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one mind, with one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't be, don't try and impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ has. And I wish, I actually wish Paul had flipped these because he's telling us that here's, you should do these things, but then he, tell, he shows us how, what Christ meant in these things. He says, I wish that you had the same attitude that Christ had. Though he was God, he did not think that equality with God was something to cling to. Instead, He gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, which is always a fun word when Paul writes, therefore, you got to pay attention. Why therefore? Therefore, God elevated him to the place of high honor and gave him a name above all names. 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and the glory of the Father. What does this mindset of Christ look like? As we begin to approximate Christ, shouldn't we begin to reflect this? Too often in our world, what do we do? We want our name. We want our glory. We want others to see me. Abram, the Jews, as they look to Father Abraham, one of the things that they look at, that they lift up and say, one of the primary reasons that God chose Abraham was because Abraham consistently over the course of his life chose others over and over and over again. And we don't really think about it too much. But here's an example. When Abram came to a place where there was not a whole lot of water and food for the, the flocks and he was living with his nephew, what did he do with Lot? He pulls Lot aside and they went up on a hill and they looked over the land and Abram said, Abram's the, he's the guy. He's the father of that Badoff, which is the family as they're moving through the desert. He had every right to pick where he wanted to go and he turns to Lot and says, where do you want to go? Abraham, he did, that's just one example. Read the story of Sarah and how he came to have married Sarah. It was an act of sacrifice. Abraham sacrificed over and over and over. Christ sacrificed. He gave up. He was God. He had every right to have what he wanted because he was God. He's the God above all other gods. And what did he do? He gave up his privilege his privilege for that. He didn't give up his divinity. Don't hear that. Don't hear what I didn't say. I didn't say he isn't God, but he did give up his privilege. And how often in our lives do we get caught up that way? And yet he asks us to do this. It's a counterintuitive thing. By our very nature, we want what we want. I probably have mentioned already, because it's a book that really impacted me, was one of my favorite books is called Humility, the Beauty of Holiness. It's a book by Andrew Murray. And I read through it and went over and over and over because as a psychologist, we're constantly talking about developing a sense of identity. And in this book, he says, humility is the act of emptying myself that God will be everything. And that's what happened right here. That God, Jesus himself, empties himself of everything that he is, that God may be everything. One of my three heresies and other dumb stuff I say. Christ is not the central figure of Christianity. God is. <laughs> and Jesus comes as God to demonstrate that and point us to God. God. This is who God is, and he does it through this sacrifice. That just that seems weird, man. Are you you're saying that if I give up what I want, that I'll be fulfilled, that I'll find purpose and meaning? Really? That's completely counter to psychology, and I'll fully admit it. It's counter to psychology. That's why I can throw the psychology out. <laughs> Right? I'm a weird therapist. <laughs> Why am I a therapist? I don't know sometimes. Right? But this is, this is actual true psychology. If we do this, then, therefore, because Christ did these things, because he acted in this way, he sacrificed, and then God elevated him. We actually will get what we need. We will get filled the way that we want, when we sacrifice what I want and the way I want and those kinds of things. So the, this is the journey. Are we becoming more and more and more like that? This is what he calls us to do. And again, Paul is saying that to the Philippians. I pray that you will continue on this journey, that you will evermore be drawn to this and look more and more like this. And that God will continue to work on you until it's completed in the day of Christ Jesus. 
Because as humans, as, as Aaron, it's really hard to let go of what I want. Really? I have to let go of it? But it's so good. Yeah. You think Christ being God was a good thing? Yeah. And he let go of his privilege. Again, he didn't let go of being God. I'm not saying he wasn't God. But he let go of the privilege of that to demonstrate what it is that God is really about. God is a God of love and of mercy and of grace and of sacrifice. He will choose to do it. He will put others before himself. He does it over and over and over. Paul, towards, towards the end, before he gets to the, the conclusion there in, in chapter three, so kind of, again, this is the ideal. This is the center. This is what the ideal perspective is. And are we on this journey of change? Are we constantly in that process of change? And, and that's our future, is to become more like Christ. He, he continues on and he talks about, I don't mean, uh, sorry, Philippians chapter three, starting in verse 12. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on into the process of that perfection for which Christ has first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on these things. Forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on, I reach uh, I press on to reach the end of the race that, uh, that, and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. It's a journey. There's a future. There's a movement in our identity that this is what God is trying to shape us in and create in us. There's the ideal, and we're moving towards that. And if Paul hasn't made it yet, as he's writing Philippians... I told you at the beginning, Paul was a genius. I love the way that he lays out his books. I wish I could do the same thing. I'm not. If he hadn't made it, I haven't made it. Right? We're on this journey. But the question for us today is, where are you at? Are you allowing yourself to move into that? Are you seeing that take shape in your own life where you have this mindset? What does it look like in practicality? What does that look like in the church? Because in the church, if we don't get it right in the church, outside of the church isn't going to see it either. And so what does it look like inside the church? And we're not going to dive too deep into chapter 4, but that's where Paul ends this book. Again, I mentioned there's two ladies who are in this conflict, and he says, these are lovely ladies who have served God well and have served with me, and there's conflict, but let's come together in this. And how do we resolve conflict? And he talks a little bit about that. But that's the call to us. Not only are we on this journey, but our future is one that we begin to look so much like Christ in our body, because the body of the church is Christ's body, representing in the world today? Do we begin to see these attributes in our walk, in our actions, in our work with one another in the church? When this happens, the world goes, that's weird. But there's peace there. There's something that's missing in my life because the world doesn't do this. The world still very much is wrapped up in their identity and getting what I want. And if you want to be a part of this, then you have to come be what I am. And so are we in that journey? Where are we at in that journey? Can we continue to pray in that? We're going to close and we're going to close with the song. Yeah, you can come up, Jack. We're going to close with this song that Jackie's brought um, to you guys called New Wine. Our identity is one that is being shaped. We are on a journey. We are new wine being poured into. This idea of sacrifice and letting go of what I want, my privilege. There's nothing wrong with the privilege. The very nature of Jesus had privilege. That was good. And yet he let go of his privilege. 
Can I let go of my privilege in my walk so that he is glorified? That we begin to look and sound more and more like Christ. That is our prayer. That's part of this new wine that's being poured into us. Father, we do come. And this is hard. This idea of change to any of us changes stress. Good changes stress. And then to hear, God, that, you're, that what you desire in us is in being more like you is to let go of what I want is even harder. It goes counter to our humanness. It goes counter to our human thought. It goes counter to our human desire. And so, Lord, I need your strength. I need faith to be able to step out, to trust that if I let go of mine, that you will be all that you will fill, that you will make all things new in me and in the world. Lord, I can't do that on my own, and so I need you to give me the strength, to give me the faith to be able to do those things. Give me your eyes so that I can see what will happen. And in that, to see the unity that comes, the glory that comes to you through the sacrifice and through the work of becoming more like your son. Lord, give us these things so that we can glorify you in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.